Um, Ron Kozakowski is a professional engineer. He specializes in troubleshooting all over North America and has over 20 years of concrete experience, although I think most of the people who know Cal have well over 20 years experience. Um, Ron had the pleasure of working for Cal and with Cal in uh, past experience and is now the Vice President of North Star Concrete Consulting since 2012. He has extensive knowledge in many areas of concrete materials and he's a voting member on several uh, ACI committees and also a member of ACI 301. With that, I'd like to turn it over to Ron to talk about large format tiles and floor flatness. Uh, I, it's a, this is a it's an honor to present on behalf of Calvin. I've known Barbara and Calvin for probably going on 15 years now. Uh, both have been a huge influence on my career and personal life too. I think a lot of people outside the concrete world that are my friends, I refer to Calvin and Barbara, uh, Calvin and Barbara as my work parents, <laughs> my concrete parents. Um, I've uh, shared a lot of time with them, and I appreciate everything that they've done for me. Uh, Calvin's a great role model. He's always willing to share his time and advice. Uh, he's got an unbelievable work ethic. Um, and anyone that knows Calvin, I think some people might say that engineers lack in personality. But anyone that knows Calvin, is uh, he knows def he's definitely not lacking in that department. He's always the life of the party. And I think one thing that always sticks out to me is Calvin's professionalism and his demeanor. He's got a very calm demeanor. I've been in many meetings with Calvin where uh, you know we're meeting with construction teams and arguments break out and things get pretty heated calvin just sits back remains calm and uh, he's like the, the steady calm voice of reason i've been there so many times where he's told a joke and kind of gotten there, everything under control and everyone back to uh, you know level-headedness and uh, I've, I've always admired that so calvin's had a lot of good influence on my career um with calvin too or anyone that knows him uh, he's never short on puns and jokes and one thing that I've heard from Calvin so many times in the past is that uh, Calvin, he he's older than dirt. And I think I found some some evidence here. This is uh, Moses McCall, the original concrete specifications. My uh, presentation today is on large format tile. It's kind of a niche uh, in specification. This is something that's popped up probably in the last 10 or 15 years. More and more large format tile is being used. And um, large format tile, the definition is, is any tile with one edge at least 15 inches or longer. And uh, they do get quite big. This picture here is we had a project in Miami where they were using actually four by four foot tiles. I couldn't find a good description or a good picture from that job. And with, their, with this topic, we're talking about dealing with con tiles that are being installed over concrete substrates. This is obviously in being installed over existing tile, but it kind of gives you an idea of how big some large format tiles can get. And um, one thing to always keep in mind is that as the tile size increases, the, the negative effect of the substrate irregularities gets compounded. So if we have a bumpy slab, then it gets more difficult to lay down tile uh, flat. We get a lot of lippage between the edges of the tile and it becomes more and more difficult. So the challenge becomes, uh, it's a conflict in portions of the specification. So we have conflicts in division nine that tells the concrete contractor how flat the slab needs to be. And then often uh, in division nine, the floor installer has ideas or requirements on how flat the floor needs to be before they install tile. So this is a small animation I put together. And one thing that compounds the issue with large format tiles, it often gets specified with a, a thin setting bed. So, you know, the thicker the setting bed with tiles, the easier it is to profile a concrete slab. This first example, it, it's probably what everyone imagines a concrete slab to be perfectly flat and level. So if we put a thin setting bed down, of course, you know, we have these very large tiles. Um, I know the color I chose for the tiles is probably ugly pink, but um, it's just easier to see. So this is an example, you know, in the unreal world, something that we hope would work. Uh, this is probably more along the lines of something that we would get. So we have a you know regular sub uh, substrate. If we have a thin setting bed and we try to lay the same tile, it doesn't lay down very flat, and we have issues. The the less flat the floor becomes. Uh, one thing, if we keep in mind too, is the effect of normal size tile. So if we had nine or ten or twelve inch tile and we try to do the same thing, we can see how the smaller tiles much easier or much more easily follow. Um, the slab profile. So the issue becomes with the very large tiles, 
uh, like I said, the irregularities in the substrate get compounded. Uh, in 2011, TCNA, uh, that's the Tile Council of North America, they adopted new requirements for the installation of large format tiles. And it's, it's very restrictive, uh, you know, which it needs to be because with the substrate irregularities, it gets harder and harder to install these large tiles. So what they came up with is that uh, with large format tile, the maximum allowable variation is an eighth inch and 10 feet um, in the required plane and no more than a 16th inch variation in 24 inches when measured from the high points on the surface. <clears throat> so um, we'll look at a table from 117 that kind of shows where this falls in the floor flatness scale. But uh, it, it, things to keep in mind is that an engineer might typically specify a fairly low flatness number. And this is, this is part of the conflict that we see pretty regularly. So we think of a conventional flatness, maybe an FF20, uh, we would have in our you know, Division Three concrete specifications. But if we look at uh, this table from 117 that talks about or kind of gives, it shows approximate versus uh, straight edge equivalents, approximate flatness values, I'm sorry. So um, on the top half here, we have uh, typical flatness numbers and the range in gaps under straight edge that we might typically find. Um, if we look at uh, the bottom half, then it's the opposite. We have a range in gaps under straight edge and typical flatness numbers. So if the TCNA says we need an eighth inch and 10 feet, that translates into a super flat floor where you have an FF in the 50, 60 range typically versus uh, a 20, which you know most conventional concrete specs or a lot of the issues that we deal with Division three is specifying a 20 when we might actually need a 60 to meet the these strict you know, TCNA requirements. And what does that lead to? Uh, that leads to disagreements between concrete contractors and flooring installers. So we have problems with division three versus division nine, and we'll get into how we try and handle that. So the disputes may be uh, we have in in the US construction specifications, division three, it's the concrete floor flatness requirements that the contractors have to follow, while Division 9 represents uh, finishes. It specifies the floor flatness that must be met before the flooring contractor can install tiles. So uh, where we run into problems is that Division 3 calls for a, a flatness of 20, where Division 9 uh, in the TCA requirements, we have an 8th inch under, uh, if we have an 8th inch and a 10 foot uh, gap, I'm sorry, if we have an eighth inch gap in 10 feet, that translates more into an, a flatness of 60. So it's, it's really important to understand how difficult it is to achieve and maintain a really high flatness for a slab on ground or elevated work. Uh, with flatness in general, it's a measure of how flat we can install a floor, but uh, it's very well known that a flat that is poured flat and level, a slab that's poured flat and level doesn't stay flat and level. So if it deflects, that changes the levelness and flatness and it decreases with time. So one solution could be that we specify a higher F value to begin with. So we might specify an FF50 or an FF60 in both Division 3 and Division 9, but it's really not reasonable. Uh, the reasons are it's very costly to achieve an initial high flatness value. So the concrete contractor would have to have many uh, steps. It would be very expensive to try to place a slab, especially elevated slabs that flat. Um, and flatness will definitely decrease with time. So it, we might be able to place an FF60, but there's no guarantee that by the time the tile is installed, it'll still be an FF60 six months or a year down the road. Um, another issue with elevated slabs is that the ACI's 117 um, tolerance compatibility guide states that FF35 is the highest feasible flatness for an elevated slabs, and it, it's really difficult to achieve in practice. So it wouldn't even be advisable to place an FF60, especially on elevated slabs. Uh, the best solution is to try to bring this to the construction team's attention, the engineer's attention, the owner's attention during the bidding process or pre-construction meetings. Uh, it's best to use a bid allowance to close the gap between known decreases in flatness and differences between <coughs> excuse me, division three and division nine. So what we would hope is that specifications uh, in these instances would target a conventional or moderately, moderately flat finish. So we might try for an FF20 or an FF30 
which is uh, very reasonable cost-wise for the owner and for the concrete contractor to place. But then to be fair to the tile installer, we would like the specifications to include an allowance for the flooring contractor to make corrections prior to installation. So the way the allowance works is that it doesn't penalize the concrete contractor or the tile installer. The engineer, I'm sorry, the owner would put that up front and it allows um, the gap to be closed. We can, uh, the, top, the con- concrete contractor can save money up front by not having to place a very flat floor. And um, then there's no arguments down the road if the tile installer is given an allowance and the ability to make corrections to make the floor flatter. And we can see how that comes into play. If we're allowed to level that uneven surface, then when we install our tile, everything's flat and uh, it'll make things much easier. For more information, ASCC has a position statement on this and it talks about closing the gap and recommendations involved with that um, and how you would go about establishing a bid allowance. That, uh, that line of thinking has been adopted by uh, seven industry organizations, including the Tile Council of North America. Uh, they do believe it is the most viable option for avoiding these kind of arguments. And this, like I said, it's something that we've seen again and again, and uh, just highlighting the challenge with Division Three versus Division Nine specifications and keeping things consistent. And for more information on this topic, uh, we had written a Q&A in Concrete International last July. So in the July edition of 2020, um, what I just presented is explained in more detail. So with that, I probably ended a little bit early, um, but that's really all I have on this. Thank you, Ron. Uh, are there any questions for Ron? I don't see any in the Q&A bubble or the chat section at the time. Uh, you do have one. Are there uh, any more comments you can give on elevated slabs? Comments as far as how to um, avoid these issues. With elevated slabs, deflections can decrease flatness uh, by a significant amount. So the, the higher flatness that you start with, um, deflections can actually reduce it. There's some literature on that that I don't have in front of me, but that is uh, one of the biggest concerns with elevated slabs is deflection with time. Okay, um, you have one more question here. Can you try a thicker mortar bedding or is that also an issue? Uh, it becomes an expense issue, but that is definitely an option. Uh, like I said, one of the things that we typically see is a thin setting bed is very commonly specified, uh, which, it, uh, which it doesn't give you any allowance for making up corrections. So uh, yes, a thick mortar bed would, similar to if you level the floors, um, if that is cheaper for an installer, um, that is definitely an option. Uh, and following up on that question, you have one more, they're rolling in. What's your uh, typical procedure for correcting levelness? Is it a skim coat or a concrete grout? Uh, well, the, I guess that would be a good discussion for an installer. I'm not sure what would be cheaper. I think the thicker setting bed is definitely an option. And um, I don't know if that would provide any cost savings over leveling a floor. I think a skim coat may be one of the easiest solutions uh, to place a skim coat down and then a self level or would uh, probably get you the FF fix, a flatness of 50 or 60 much, uh, much more quickly. 